my dear student colleagues and all the viewers watching this program live from facebook page and youtube channel i'd like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar today it's our 257 international physics webinar and we have with us here dr michael strickland sir professor department of physics kent state university usa uh, he has already connected with us sir good morning and good evening to here thanks for joining with us yes good uh, morning and evening yeah thanks again sir for accepting our invitation so dear student and viewers i think uh, you will enjoy this session and i think you if you have already come to know the title of this today's uh, webinar is and the title is quantum chromodynamics at 7 trillion kelvin and our speaker is dr michael strickland professor department of physics kent state university usa uh, dr michael strickland is a theoretical physicist and who specializes in high energy particle physics heavy ion collisions and finite temperature density quantum field theory michael's primary interest uh, is the physics of quark gluon plasma these plasmas are predicted by quantum chromodynamics qcd to have existed until approximately 2 to the minus 5 second after the big bang and are currently being studied terrestrially by experimentalists at the relativistic heavy ion collider at brookhaven national laboratory and the large hadron collider at cern this exciting experiment are increasing our knowledge of the behavior of matter under extreme condition uh, he has uh, several publications so i think you will enjoy our this exciting webinar sir uh, it's your time you can start your session okay thank you dr kumar for organizing this and all of the other it's talks that you've been organizing online it's a very nice series i've watched some myself and i'm glad to be a part of it so what i'm going to talk to you about today is is in the title quantum chromodynamics at 7 trillion kelvin um such temperatures as 7 trillion kelvin um that were only generated usually in the early universe and as dr kumar pointed out um the universe only dropped below this temperature at about 10 to the minus 5 seconds after the big bang prior to this time the entire universe um was in a, a kind of deconfined phase called the quark gluon plasma um we're now trying well not trying we're reproducing the state of matter in the lab um the background to the title slide is an actual event readout um from one of the the collision events and the tracks are all the different uh, hadrons that got produced in that event as you can see many many hadrons are produced and in this case the underlying event was a single um ion ion collision in this case a heavy ion lead lead collision so why why do we want to do this well we we know for the last let's say 40 years 50 years that Um protons and neutrons are not fundamental constituents of matter they are made up of uh, smaller particles called quarks and the quarks come in six flavors up down strange charm top and bottom and um they are con normally confined into what are called color neutral states where we have to combine a red quark a blue quark and a green quark into a color neutral state um and this is a property of QCD quantum chromodynamics which is called confinement so that's why this says quarks and gluons are normally confined inside of hadrons. And um then the nucleons themselves build up the nucleus of the atom um and but at the very fundamental level these things are 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 confined and you can never produce an individual quark. Now people started um to question whether or not this would remain true if you were to start heating up nuclear matter. So the the idea in the, I guess the mid 70s was well a thought exercise imagine I could take a bunch of hadrons which are color neutral combinations of three or two a quark and an anti quark that's a meson and I were to put this into a box and start heating it up to this you know trillion degree mark and um the prediction was that what what would happen is that at very high temperatures you would get a color ionized plasma where the the quarks and gluons I only show the quarks here for for the illustration purposes are are deconfined and able to move over a much larger uh, volume of space now as i said um this is relevant for early universe cosmology at around the minus 10 to the minus 5 second mark 
At this point in time, the quarks and the gluons clumped up to become the hadrons, um, the baryons, which have three, and the mesons, which have a quark and an antiquark. And then at a much later time, we come along. Now, um, you can't study this uh, phase transition using uh, telescopes because basically the, the line for at least visual uh, telescopy is here at about 300,000 years after the, the Big Bang. That's the point where atoms were formed and light could then propagate freely through the universe. Um, and this uh, radiation that was uh, produced at this time, we call the cosmic microwave uh, background radiation. Before this time, the universe was opaque to light and uh, basically all signals are scrambled. So you can't, with a you know visual telescope, see back further in time uh, than, than this 300,000 year mark. In order to go back in time closer to the Big Bang, what we have to do is con construct uh, a series of uh, ever larger particle colliders that will allow us to first study the physics of, of nucleons and then eventually the sub con the constituents of the nucleons, the quarks. And then if we can keep pushing up the energy, then we can get back into this phase where the, where the quarks are liberated. Now this phase transition is fundamentally important to life. At least 98% of the visible mass uh, of the universe, uh, the baryonic content is, is actually generated during uh, this phase transition. We know from popular discussions and recent uh, you know, Nobel Prizes that um, quarks and other fundamental uh, particles uh, receive their mass, uh, which is called their bare mass, um, through uh, their interaction with something called the Higgs field. However, this only provides 2% of their mass. The true mass of a, of a nucleon, which the proton has a mass on the order of one GeV in high energy units, and the quarks have masses of like 10 MeV max. So the rest of the mass has to come from something and it comes from a non-perturbative quark condensate. And in this case, the quarks then have to propagate through this quark condensate, which then Im imbues them with, with what, that, what we'll call the constituent uh, quark masses. And uh, this can be um, studied on the lattice. This can also be studied analytically using something called Schwinger-Dyson equations. And, and this is showing the mass function as a function of momentum of the, the mass that's been acquired by the gluon cloud, essentially, that's surrounding this quark as it flies around. And from the bottom right thing, we can see that the top quark, the heaviest of the quarks, it receives basically all of its mass from the Higgs. But as we get down to the up quark, it only receives, a, this is a logarithmic scale, it only receives a very small amount of its mass through the interaction with the Higgs field, and the rest comes from, from purely QCD interactions. So that's why people were, are, and, and still are, fundamentally interested in this phase transition. It's basically when all baryonic mass is, is created in the universe. We have a, a series of experiments around the world that are um, trying to recreate uh, the quark gluon plasma phase, and they're doing it at, at various collision energies. Um, at the relativistic heavy ion collider at Brookhaven National Lab, they're colliding gold nuclei on gold nuclei at 200 GeV per nucleon. And remember, the, each of these has roughly 200 uh, nucleons, so we're talking about a 4 TeV collision here. And at Rick's highest energies, um, fits to the data tell us, and I'll show you some of these fits in a few slides, that the initial temperatures that are generated are on the order of 400 MeV. Now, the phase transition is expected to occur at around 200 MeV. So this is about twice that phase transition temperature, and it shows us that we've pushed sort of marginally into the quark gluon plasma phase. Um, now at LHC, um, starting roughly 10 years ago, they started to do lead-lead collisions, first at 2.76 uh, TeV and now at 5 TeV um, per nucleon. So this is you know, yet another order of magnitude higher in collision energies. At 2.76, one expects to have an, generate initial temperatures on the order of 600 MeV, so around three times the transition temperature, and here around 3.5 times the transition temperature. There are other experiments going on, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about later when we see the phase diagram, but there's, they're actually at RIC now lowering the beam energy and studying uh, collisions with 7.7 um, .7 to 39 GeV in order to generate lower temperatures, but higher uh, baryon density. 
what occurs in the quark quantum plasma is we have these two uh, nuclei. That's what's shown in the lower left animation that, that is on a loop. And it shows it from the moment that they sort of are passing through one another. And this plasma that's being generated in its wake between the two receding sheets is the, is the stuff that we're really looking at. But as you can see, a large amount of the energy, in fact, almost all of the baryon number at the highest RIC and LHC energies just continues down the beam pipe. And this matter that's created in the wake of the, of the two heavy ions colliding is in the first instant primarily made up of gluons. These gluons then uh, pair produce quarks and antiquarks, but they, because they're always pair producing, the, the state in, of the matter in between these two receding sheets um, always has approximately zero um, uh, bar net baryon number. There is, I say approximately because a few quarks can be stopped during this, but it, it's rare. Now, if you lower the collision energy, you'll get more um, baryon stopping in the reaction, and then you can deposit more baryon number into the, into the plasma, essentially. And that's why these experiments are going on, and I'll tell you theoretically why they're interested. interesting. Um, there are also experiments um, planned at, at FAIR, GSI, which are under construction, again, probing this low energy regime and, um, and ongoing stuff and planned at Nika, Nika in, in Dubna. This is the event display that I showed you that comes out, out of you know, a single one of these events. Um, let's set the, the scales here for, for the event. So a nucleus has a, has a size of about 10 to the minus 14 meters across. Um, during a, a typical collision, we're not going to hit them head on. They're going to have some impact parameter, which measures the, the difference between the center of this nucleus and the center of the nucleus over here. In, in practice, it's extremely hard to, to hit to 10 to the minus 14 objects directly head on. So in practice, the experimentalists just collide over and over again and then bin the events by by multiplicity in, in, in order to infer uh, the impact parameter. As I said, there's a quark on plasma that's generated in the wake. These two things have already passed through one another. This is my artist rendition of the quark on plasma. Now this thing is, is expanding because it's an expanding uh, gas, if you like, um, it's going to cool down. And although you might generate an initial temperature of say 700 MeV through this first longitudinal expansion, and then secondarily it starts expanding also in the transverse direction, um, this plasma will cool down as a function of time. And eventually it will go through uh, a phase transition from the quark gluon plasma phase back to the hadronic phase. And those hadrons are what then the experimentalists measure in the laboratory. Um, the entire quark gluon plasma event um, between you know, the collision, then the cooling down, uh, lasts about three times 10 to the minus 23 seconds. So it's virtually impossible, I will say impossible, to, um, to send any probe through and, and, and look at this. What you have to do is look at the, decay, the final products that were produced in, in the collision, and then try to infer properties about the quark gluon plasma that was created on this uh, very, very short time scale. Now, um, all of this um, knowledge of what happens to quantum chromodynamics when you heat it up or squeeze it can be compressed into something called the QCD phase diagram. Um, let's first focus on the inset here. This is showing a, a familiar uh, material called uh, water or HTO, <laughs> and it has um, it has three different phases, as we know. It has a liquid phase, which we call water, and then we have a, a gaseous phase, water vapor, and then we also have a solid phase, which is called ice. And by staring at this graph, we can, we can you know, for any particular pressure and any temperature, we can tell you in which phase the, the matter is existing. And of course, if I take ice and I heat it up at near one, uh, um, one atmospheric pressure, I'm going to go from ice to water to water vapor. However, if I go way up here, um, it turns out that this phase transition has, uh, has a line of first order phase transitions in which some order parameter changes discontinuously as we go from one phase to another. Then there's a critical point where if I were to pass right through here, it would be a second order phase transition. And if I go beyond over here, it's uh, what's called a crossover. I sort of smoothly go from water to water vapor and I can go back and forth. This is some, some, sometimes called supercritical heating, right? We're above the, the critical point here. 
Now, um, the same features can be seen in the QCD phase diagram, which is the main thing down here. We have a line of uh, first order phase transitions in which there's a discontinuous uh, uh, change here in the energy density, for example, between the two phases. And then there's a uh, second order uh, phase transition line, which is called the critical endpoint. I put a question mark here because we don't know exactly where this is. People try to calculate it from using lattice methods. Um, but ultimately, it's an experimental question, and that's why um, these lower energy experiments are going on. They're trying to probe um, to find this, this critical endpoint. Now, as we go beyond the critical endpoint, we see that I've drawn a dashed line to indicate that it's not a true um, uh, discontinuous phase transition. Everything is, is completely smooth. All derivatives of thermodynamics quantities are completely smooth across this line. And um, here, um, and the very, very low net baryon density, but high temperature regime, you can use lattice QCD to measure the equation of state. It gets difficult to go out in this direction, in the finite uh, baryochemical uh, potential direction, because of something called the sign problem. Um, fundamentally, it, this results from the fact that the, the path integral measure at finite mu b is not a, a positive definite number that I can, a real number that I can use as a, as a probability uh, measure. It becomes some complex number and, and you can't even apply naive Monte Carlo sampling. Now, many people in the world are trying to work on methods to extend um, lattice measurements out here, but um, it's still a work in progress. Most of them still rely on um, making measurements here in the very small mu b region and then computing uh, coefficients or susceptibilities in order to uh, allow them to get some information about what's going on out here in, in at finite chemical potential. So um, these highest energy heavy ion collisions are probing initial temperatures on the order, as I said before, of 600 MeV. And as we if we were to follow their their time evolution, they're they're evolving very close to this mu b is equal to zero axis, and then they come down and they eventually land over here because they they re reform. Actually, they, they stay just over here because they become very dilute and they don't reform a nucleus. If the nucleus were to reform, uh, they would jump back over here. But of course, they get the, the hadronic matter gets spread out in space. And so you, you basically just come straight down on this axis. As we lower the collision energy, we basically move over here. We will lower the, uh, the initial temperature, but increase mu b. And the hope is that we can generate um, uh, experimental events where it will pass in the vicinity of this second order point, and we can try to pin down where it is in, in the phase diagram. Now, as we continue to move to even higher um, uh, baryochemical uh, potentials or density, if you like, um, we start to enter the regime, which is interesting uh, to astrophysicists, because over here is where um, neutron star matter lives. And there's a possibility that in the core of neutron stars, you go through this phase transition and you land into a phase where it's best described as, as quarks. And this typically happens in the core of, of neutron stars. And uh, modern estimates are that the, the sort of inside one to two kilometers of a, of a neutron star is made up of quark matter. And then after that, it goes into nuclear matter and then normal nuclei on, as the crust on, on the outside. Now, going up in temperature, um, there are astrophysical events that, that probe this part of the phase diagram, and they are the supernova that originally formed the neutro neutron stars, because here you can generate temperatures on the order of, say, uh, 10 to 20 MeV during the explosion, uh, maybe more. Um, but also recently, um, the mergers of neutron stars have become important, because here you can generate um, temperatures during the event that are on the order of, of 90 MeV. So even if you were subcritical here in mu b, um, you might be pushed above the phase transition line just because of the, uh, of the temperature that's generated during the merger itself, the heating up. So um, people are very interested in this over here, and that's why um, these sort of even lower energy experiments are, are on the slate to try to determine information about the equation of state itself over here in, in this region. Today, I'm going to focus on, on the high energy part of this, um, where again, to first approximation, you can, you can assume that, that mu b is, is zero. In that case, it's possible to use these lattice QCD methods in order to measure the equation of state. So what's 
plotted here is the pressure of a gas of quarks and gluons at, uh, divided by its ideal pressure, sometimes called the Stefan Boltzmann limit. So this would be if it was a gas of non-interacting quarks and gluons. Because of asymptotic freedom of QCD, we expect that as the temperature increases, that means the average momentum of the particle increases, particles increase, and that means the average momentum exchanges increase. We expect that in this very high temperature limit that this uh, ratio should go to one because it, um, it is an asymptotically free uh, theory. However, um, here's the lattice measurement in the experimentally relevant regime. There are these red dots with the error bars on them. And as we can see, it still has large deviations from one, even at, um, at, at roughly 1200 MeV. In order to get it very close to, to one, you have to go to like 10 to the fifth GeV. And this is because the QCD coupling constant only runs logarithmically um, with the energy scale. So it runs logarithmically with this temperature. So you have to increase by you know, another order, order of magnitude and get one, one click closer to one on this plot. In addition to the, the lattice data is the red points here. I've put uh, at low temperatures, uh, the results, or at least a cartoon representation of the results of what would happen if you modeled the, mat the matter um, as just a gas of hadrons. So uh, protons, neutrons, lambdas, take all of the hadrons that you can find from the particle data book, put them into a thermodynamics calculation and cal calculate the pressure of that hadron resonance gas. Um, the, the, the orange line is what you would get. And as you can see at very low temperature, this seems to describe the, the lattice data uh, very well, but starting at about 160 or so, we see that um, this goes off the, the lattice curve, but is well described by a different curve, which is this black curve that's going up here. The black curve is a um, analytic calculation of the equation of state of the quark gluon plasma by myself and collaborators. And as you can see, it describes the, the lattice data quite well. And so um, by looking at this curve, you can sort of see that we're making this transition from, from the hadron resonance gas to the quark gluon plasma um, in the experimental uh, regime. And if we work hard, um, we can calculate this black line and we can even um, analytically understand this correction from one. Now, I've put the, the various uh, initial collision energies that we expect at RIC, LHC and, L and the highest energy LHC runs here. And this is just to show you visually that with the highest L energy LHC runs, we are definitely getting into this quark gluon plasma phase and very, very far from, from the hadron resonance gas phase. Now I'd like to quickly explain to you um, where the black line comes from because I don't like to show curves without an explanation. And this is the analytic expression for that black curve. Um, it comes from a calculation in which you compute thermodynamics of the quark gluon plasma. That involves computing graphs of this class where they're closed on what they're called vacuum diagrams. These is the one loop order, this is two loop order, and this is three loop order. Now, um, this is um, not a purely perturbative calculation because um, if it was purely perturbative, we would just put the bare gluon propagator here, the bare quark propagator here, in which they only have their Higgs masses. But in fact, that turns out to be the wrong thing to do because um, at high temperatures, um, you get generation of masses um, with the mass of the, of the gluon being proportional to the temperature and the mass of the quark also proportional to the temperature. So there's an in medium effect that you have to include. And we do this through a complicated uh, theory called hard thermal loop perturbation theory. So this is actually represents a resummed graph that has an, a, an exact HTL propagator in here. And this is an, also an exact HTL propagator. And likewise, in these higher order graphs, um, these are exact propagators um, in the HTL limit, and also the vertex functions also have to be dressed. But after a large, it's a, it's a hard slug, but after 10 years, you can write down um, some analytic expression. Um, and if you plug in the central value of the scale and plot it, you'll find that it goes um, basically through the lattice data. This expression um, works at finite t and also at finite mu b. Um, so it was quite a breakthrough when we got it. Um, so we can now describe this lattice data at mu b is equal to zero. Ignore the, the blue points, they've since been retracted and the red points are the correct answer. Um, and also at finite mu b, here is mu b of, of, of 400 MeV. 
And by measuring when does this analytic curve, the black curve, go to zero as a function of mu b, we can make a prediction for the curvature of the phase transition line um, um, as a function of t and the burial chemical potential. And as you can see here, um, there, the lattice data is this purpley blue, um, and the HTL analytic calculation seems to reproduce this quite well. And we had a recent paper about this with Najmul Haq, or I had a recent paper with him, uh, where we, we analytically calculated these curvature coefficients compared to the lattice, and, and we found um, quite amazing agreement. Um, in the, at finite chemical potential, with the same calculation, that same giant analytic expression that I showed you a couple of slides ago, you can now describe a bunch of lattice data. This is for the, the um, second order uh, baryonic susceptibility scaled by its free value as a function of T. Again, the points are lattice data and the curves are these resummed um, perturbative calculations. Um, if you start looking at the fourth order light quark susceptibility, you find actually excellent agreement between the lattice data and the HTLPT prediction starting already around 250 MeV. And similar story with the fourth order baryon susceptibility and, and this fourth order mixed susceptibility. So the amazing thing is that the lattice people have worked uh, very hard, but we've also been working hard on the analytic front, uh, front and we believe that we have a, a good model of the QCD uh, thermodynamics above roughly, let's say 250 MeV in temperature to 300. So um, what we've learned over that course of 10 years doing those calculations and then comparing the lattices up here, this part of at least the thermodynamics is very well described by quark and gluon quasi particles. And down here, it's, it's very well described by the hadron gas. That was the, the orange curve on the original plot. The hard part is here what happens in the in this transition region, and uh, and this is truly non-perturbative. Even these resummed perturbative calculations will break down because they're only written in terms of quark and gluon degrees of freedom. They have no way to truly uh, connect to the to the hadronic phase. But in this region, um, we have reliable lattice measurements, at least down here in the low baryon baryo chemical uh, potential region, so we can use those for phenomenology. But at least um, you know, in the asymptotic regimes up here at high temperatures and low temperatures, we have a very good understanding of the, of the information that's coming out of the lattice. So as I mentioned earlier, um, there are a couple of different experiments going on. Um, in the US, the main one is this relativistic heavy ion collider at Brookhaven National Lab. It's on the end of, of Long Island. This is a picture from um, a plane. And uh, here is the, um, where the old linear accelerator, which is now used as a, you know, just a, a first stage, um, which goes into a, an older circular accelerator, which was called the alternating uh, I forget when she is gradient synchrotron, yeah. Um, and then they whip the the, nu uh, the nuclei around this ring, and then they get sent into um, the main ring of Rick. Um, and part of the beam gets sent around clockwise, part of the beam gets sent around uh, counterclockwise, and then they're made to cross at four experimental stations. At least there were originally four experimental stations operating. Right now we only have uh, STAR operating and Phoenix will come back online in, a, in about a year as something called Super Phoenix. Um, then uh, there's uh, you know, a similar story at the Large Hadron Collider um, they use the old SPS ring to inject um, nuclei and also um, protons at, at large at the LHC into the ring. And then they collide them and collect information at the four experimental stations, which are CMS, LHCB, ATLAS, and ELISE. Now, luckily for the heavy ion community, there were no um, immediate signs of, of beyond standard model physics. Uh, we got the Higgs, but um, going beyond that to see if there's any uh, potential supersymmetry in the signals and such has, has proven to be difficult and, and no signatures have been seen. The benefit for the heavy ion physics community was that that meant that um, these other collaborations, ATLAS, LHCB, and CMS, would join the specifically heavy ion collision um, experiment, ALICE, 
and start collecting lots of heavy ion data as well. So for us, not finding BSM physics has turned out to be a boon because these experiments have now started collecting data for us on the heavy ion front. This, this we've already seen, so I can, I can skip over, but let me talk a little bit more about the time scale here. So as I mentioned earlier, the time scale for the entire collision was, is about uh, 10 Fermi over C, which in human units get, translates into three times 10 to the minus 23 seconds. But we're gonna count time in, in Fermi over C from now on since it's easier uh, to do. This is a space-time diagram of a heavy ion collision. We had a nucleus A, which is coming along to the left, and a nucleus B, which was going along uh, to the right here. They collided at some point in the past here at the collision point, and at least at high energies, they, they pass right on through one another. And this is now the space-time diagram of that um, matter that was pulled between the two, two sheets. And here is, is showing what it might actually lo look like in space-time. Now, they're incredibly Lorentz contracted here because um, at high energies, uh, the, the high velocities of these nuclei I mean that they're Lorentz contracted along their direction of motion. And um, at LEC energies, this, this gamma factor is about a thousand. So uh, the nucleus is squeezed by a factor of thousand in the longitudinal direction. And that means that this pass through when it occurs only takes um, about 0 0.1, <laughs> maybe 0 0.01 rather, uh, Fermi over C. And then after that, you start pulling out this quirk on plasma um, in the wake. Now, what's visualized here are the hadrons that have, were produced on something called the freeze out hypersurface. We can't see in this vis particular visualization inside to see that there's a quirk on plasma hiding underneath that's producing all of these hadrons in the first place. Now, at the, the earliest moments after the nuclear pass through, um, there's lots of theory um, for how, how you can describe this matter. And the main tool is something called the colored glass condensate. And it's the realization that because you have prolific gluon production here at early times, um, you're gonna be very uh, sensitive uh, to the, the gluon content of the nuclei themselves. And at this early time, because there's so many gluons around, it turns out mathematically that describing them on a particle by particle basis is not the most efficient thing to do. You can go to the classical limit in which you can now model it as a gluon field instead. And you can use sort of semi-classical description to describe it, this saturated gluon field and its evolution. Now, as the system expands and cools down, the occup occupation number of the gluons drops, the occupation number of quarks and anti-quarks increases through pair production, but the system becomes more di dilute. And at some point, it becomes the field description is disfavored and you want to start using some sort of particle transport like the Boltzmann equation or the boltzmann vlasov equation. And then if the system gets uh, sufficiently close to equilibrium and people argue over what is sufficiently close these days, then you can start modeling this um, phase using something called relativistic hydrodynamics. And in that case, you can describe this as a fluid um, that is expanding and cooling and then um, you then sample hadrons from this, this uh, the final state um, using something called cooper fry hadronization. Now, what are the experimental observables that experimentalists look at uh, in order to determine whether A, we made the quirk clone plasma, and B, um, what, what are its properties? So I'll just go through the list. We can't go through all of them today, but um, I'll present some of them. So the first thing is the particle spectra across species. So, um, so in the experiment, they um, collect all of the hadrons that are within their acceptance at least, and then they can um, calculate the spectra, like how many pions do I have at this momentum versus this momentum, and, and just do a, you know, a simple binning exercise, and then plot the, you know, the number of pions as a function of PT, you can then repeat the exercise, do it as the number of kaons as a function of TPT. You can do it for all hadron species. And the prediction um, is that if you had generated a thermalized state, um, the production um, uh, here should be thermal, um, <coughs> which means that discounting the possible effects of some flow of the matter, you should get exponential um, uh, spectra for all of these hadrons, and particularly the very, very light ones. <coughs> 
So this is one of the first things that the experimentalists look for. Just measure the identified hadron species, uh, uh, species uh, spectra and then see if the particle distributions are, are well fit by what are called thermal models. Now, uh, one possibility um, that was raised in the late 90s was to use something called collective flow. And I'll go into some details about this, so we'll come back to it. Um, the third thing that people look at is, is what's called jet quenching. And that stems from the fact that if I had a jet produced inside of the quark colon plasma, let's say it was produced here on the edge and one part of the jet was shooting out into the void and the other part had to shoot through the quark colon plasma, that this, um, this guy on the, on, the, on the long side, let's say, um, is going to be suppressed because it, it undergoes a lot of scatterings with the, with the quarks along the way and the gluons and it will lose energy. And this is in fact seen in the, in the experimental uh, data. You can plot the jet distribution on the near and far side and you'll see that you get a near side peak, which is the, the one that escaped and a far side, there's no, there's no jet count part. It got eaten by the plasma. So this particular observable provides us information about by how much uh, you know, the, the far side components of the jet diffuse in momentum space and also um, how much energy they lose as they propagate through the quark colon plasma. The suppression of heavy quarkonium, I'll come back to that because um, we're going to focus on it. Um, electromagnetic radiation. This is a, a very interesting um, uh, observable um, because it does not suffer from uh, very strong uh, strong force interactions or QCD interactions. Once you produce a photon, it only couples uh, radiative uh, through E and M uh, through to the quark colon plasma. And because uh, alpha E and M is one over 137 and, and is much, much, much smaller than alpha S, to first approximation, any photon or dilepton that you produce it can freely escape the plasma and provide information about the initial conditions. There are other things that people do, and one of the, the most important um, is multi-particle correlations. And from looking at quantum correlations between pi plus, pi minus, um, also neutral pions, and if you can do it, k plus, k minus, um, you can determine information about the size of the fireball directly using um, something stolen from astrophysics, um, which is Hanbury brand twist, but now that's being applied on the femtometer scale instead of the, the star scale. So I'm, I'm going to focus on, on these three, the particle spectra across spe species, collective flow, and, and, and quarkonium in the second part of the talk. So as I mentioned, one of the primary tools that people use to model this sort of bulk part of the, of the hadronic evolution is hydrodynamics. And these days it's, it's something called second order viscous hydrodynamics or in general dissipative hydrodynamics if you go beyond uh, second order. And I don't have time to describe what second order means technically. Um, but from those simulations, you can produce predictions for these identified particle spectra. This is from a paper with my students and a postdoc from 2017. What's plotted here is the, the pion spectra, kaon spectrum, and proton spectra. And each of these different panels corresponds to a different impact parameter. This is a nearly head-on collision going down here to a very peripheral collision. And um, we would you know, initialize some uh, hydrodynamic fireball at say 0 0.25 Fermi over C after the nuclear pass through, run this hydrodynamic simulation and then um, fit the initial temperature and something called the shear viscosity to entropy density ratio in order to best describe the data. And we would do that basically in these two centrality classes and there's only three parameters hiding here. And then we were able to describe um, the pion, kaon, and proton spectrum extremely well. And if you repeat that exercise at, at all different uh, centrality classes, you'll see that at least for the low momentum part of the spectrum, um, you can very well describe the data. Now, at some point, this will start to break because it eventually you'll get to such a peripheral collision that you don't generate the quark colon plasma at all. And so uh, eventually we, we do expect this to, to, to break and, and this disagreement is, is, is expected. But at the most central collisions, um, we have excellent agreement between you know, the theory models um, and, and the data. Now these 
theory models, they have this dynamical hydro component to them, but they also use information from the lattice. So the precise uh, equation of state um, that was measured by lattice QCD was, is an input into these simulations. Um, another thing that you can, you can measure simply, and it is actually one of the first things that experimentalists measure when they turn on a heavy ion collision experiment is what's called the charged particle multiplicity. Um, the horizontal axis is, is something called the pseudo rapidity, where um, it's an angle. So um, pseudo rapidity zero means something that's shooting out di directly perpendicular to the beam axis. And pseudo, uh, pseudo rapidity going up to minus infinity or plus infinity are stuff going out along or against the beam line direction. And you can, using these same hydro models, just make a prediction for the number of charged particles that you see per unit rapidity, and then compare to data. And here are these different centrality classes going from a nearly central collision to ultimately a very, very peripheral collision down here in the bottom. And as you can see, we now have reasonably good control over, over this theoretically, and the um, theoretical predictions agree quite well um, with the data. Not only can a hydro do this, there are other um, hydrodynamic models on the market um, that can have equally good uh, description of the data. So that brings us to collective flow. So the, the next thing that you might consider measuring is instead of just measuring the total number of particles, which was that thing we were looking at before, we might want to look at the number of particles um, as a function of the azimuthal angle. Um, so, as I said before, it's very difficult to have a, a direct um, head-on nucleus-nucleus collision. It does happen <laughs> with extreme rarity, but um, in, in practice, you get something that's a peripheral collision. This was the uh, one nucleus, this is the other, this is the plasma tube that was drawn out between them, and generically, you get an elliptically deformed overlap region just because these guys don't collide head-on. And um, there were predictions going back to 2020, so 20 years ago. Um, these were using ideal hydrodynamics at the time, but they suggested that if you had a strongly coupled quark gluon plasma here, that you would see a push out along this short side direction, um, preferentially over the long side direction, simply because the energy density gradients are, are um are stronger in the short side than in the long side, and that generates a push out. And you can see that in this um, now 20 year old uh, simulation. And uh, the, these particles that are pushed out along the short side, um, because they you know, rolled down a, a taller hill, they have higher momentum. So you would have a high momentum excess on this side um, compared um, to, to the long side. Now you can, you can measure this um, just by putting a, uh, you know, a detector around the beam line and then measuring the number of particles that come out at each angle and binning them in an angle. That's this measurement here. The leading order number here is just the total number of particles produced, sometimes called V0, but it's just the total number of particles if I integrate over D phi here. The second one tells me if it's pushing to the left and to the right, um, uh, that usually doesn't occur at central rapidities in a symmetric collision, but in asymmetric collisions, this can occur at central rapidities. Um, the more interesting one was this V2 coefficient, which is related to this elliptic deformation of the nuclei themselves. Um, and the prediction was that because of this elliptic deformation, you would get a positive V2. You would get more particles being shot out in this direction at higher momentum than, than in this direction. And that would result in, in this cosine 2 phi modulation of the, of the um, total number of particles. And by simply measuring the, um, sorry, just a second. By simply measuring uh, the number of particles as a function of azimuthal angle, you can then fit this coefficient uh, V2. Now, um, in general, um, a nucleus collision doesn't look like a perfect elliptically deformed region because um, you have probabilities and quantum stuff going on here, which will, in each, in an event by event simulation, this, um, this, the overlap region will reflect the fact that there are nucleons hiding inside of the nucleus. And if we now measure the particle distribution around here, it will not only have a very strong elliptic coefficient, it may also have 
Um, in, in this particular case, it has a, a high V4 because we can see this sort of four-fold symmetry at, at late times appearing here. And in general, what the experimentalists do is simply measure the number of particles around and they do um, a Fourier transform to fit and extract these coefficients, V1, V2, and V3. In a real collision, now taking into account these, um, these fluctuations, you can see that the evolution on the left is showing the temperature can have multiple Fourier modes. And in order to do this right, you have to simulate fluctuating initial conditions over many, many samples, and then average over those many, many samples in order to make a prediction for the experimentally observed uh, uh, elliptic flow or triangular flow or quadrangle, quadrangular flow, et cetera. This was done um, in, by ourselves, but also just to show you some other group's results. This is Charles Gale, uh, Sengyong Jian, and Bjorn Schenke from, from 2013. And what's plotted here are those um, elliptic flow coefficients. This is V2, V3, V4, and V5. At this point, there wasn't experimental data for V5, but they made a prediction. And um, this was comparing to Alice data, and on the right was comparing to Atlas data. And um, so now we have a, a very good understanding of both um, the particle number and then also the space-time dynamics of the plasma and how it, you know, these initial fluctuations in geometry are reflected in these um, these elliptic flow these uh, flow coefficients v1, v2, v3, and so on. And that has been a great success of hydrodynamics. This code was also a hydro relativistic hydrodynamics code, and most relativistic hydrodynamics codes uh, to date can now uh, reproduce this uh, agreement with, with the data. So um, one thing to mention here is that if you hadn't generated the quark gluon plasma, let's say that for some reason it wasn't very strongly coupled, then this, it would be very inefficient to translate this initial uh, energy density gradient into flow. And the prediction is that these coefficients should go to zero eventually, that you would get perfectly isotropic emission. And that's not what's seen in the experiment. We see very large um, V2 and, and, and subleading coefficients, which told people that the, the plasma is not a, a super weakly coupled um, collection of quarks and, uh, and gluons, but is instead uh, strongly coupled. The other thing that I wanted to talk about was um, the suppression of heavy quarkonium. So if you imagine that you, you would create a bound state of, let's say, a bottom and an anti-bottom quark. In, in the PDG, these states, uh, the ground state of this is something called the upsilon, and it has a mass on the order of, uh, of 10 uh, GeV. And the mass of the bottom quark itself is on the order of 5 uh, GeV. <coughs> but it is possible to produce these in experiment and observe them. Here is experimental observation of the bound state, ground state of, the, of a BB bar um, singlet, which is called the Upsilon 1s. This is the first radial excitation, the 2s, and this is the second radial excitation, the 3s. And uh, the, the points here are experimental uh, data points from the LACB collaboration. And uh, the, it, once you subtract the background, which is this sort of curve that's writing here, you can extract very nice peaks for the 1s, 2s, and 3s. And from here, measure their, their, um, their masses, their widths, and so on. Now, um, if you were to take a BB bar bound state and drop it into a quark on plasma and start to increase the temperature, what you would find is that at a certain temperature, um, these states would, would start to become washed out. They would become very, very broad states and also their number would decrease um, simply because in the plasma, we have screening of the interaction. This is evidenced by um, a lattice calculation shown in the upper right-hand corner that shows in black the, um, the quark anti-quark potential, the singlet free energy, um, at zero temperature. And as we can see at, at very large distances, it starts to look like a Cornell potential that's linearly rising. And uh, this will continue until you hit the string breaking scale. And then the various colored lines are what happens if you start increasing the temperature. 
And as you can see, the interaction is becoming screened. So if I had a, a bound state that was sitting up here in this potential, by the time I hit say 1800, which is way down here, that bound state that was sitting up here in the potential has been uh, disassociated. And the earlier idea, early idea, which came from, from Shuriak way um, back in the 80s, and then Matsui and Sat sort of formalized it in the, in the potential language in the, in the late 80s, um, was that because of this, um, melting of the potential, essentially, that you, we would see uh, suppression of these states if a quark gluon plasma was actually formed. Um, and that's, you know, in the cartoon form shown here below. And now I can luckily show you the experimental data for this. So this is experimental data. Um, now the dimuon spectrum, this is from the CMS collaboration for PP collisions. This has been background subtracted to make it flat so that you can see the 1S, the 2S, and the 3S. This is in PP. And on the right is the data they collected in the highest energy lead-lead collisions. And once again, you can reconstruct a, a 1S peak, but once you get to the 2S, you see a very, very um, suppressed signal. And by the time you get to the 3S, it's completely gone. Overlaid on this is the expectation that you would have if, <laughs> if the lead-lead collision was nothing but a bunch of nucleon-nucleon collisions. And this would be what you would expect to be produced. But what you see is this suppression. And um, these days we're, we're working hard to understand this theoretically, and, and we believe we're doing a good job. Now, um, this is an active area. So CMS, ATLAS, at, um, um, Alice and LECB, all four stations are now collecting data for this observable. And because they've been collecting it now for a number of years, we're starting to get to a level of statistics where we can extract not only by how much is the state suppressed, which is you can read off from this graph, um, we can also start e extracting their elliptic flow as well. So now the azimuthal distribution of, of uh, say, bottomonium production. Now, um, if you wanted to compute this theoretically, it's it's conceptually very simple. You have to you have a, um, a some underlying hydro event. This might be what it evolves like in time um, and in space. As we move to the right, it's going further in time, and this is just a slice in the in the x y plane of the of the collision. And then you can imagine that at some point here, I produce a bottomonium pair through some hard collision between the quarks and the gluons and the incoming nuclei that those are produced at very early. Basically, T is equal to zero because of the very, very high mass of the, of the upsilon state. And then they, they propagate through the plasma as it expands, and then they uh, you know, get suppressed along that path. But we have to do this um, you know, a bunch of times in order to get a reliable measure of by how much are they suppressed and how are they uh, suppressed differentially because ones that are flying out along this direction will have less suppression than ones that are flying out along this direction simply because there's a longer path length over here. So we have to do a kind of Monte Carlo study where we sample bottomonium states and, and shoot them through the plasma. And the observable that we use is this um, is what's called the suppression factor. And this is the number that we see experimentally um, divided by our expectation if no quark gluon plasma had been correct, uh, created during the event. And that expectation is based on just taking the average number of binary collisions between nucleus, nucleons in, the, in nucleus A and nucleus B and multiplying it by the number experimentally measured of upsilon states that are produced in a PP collision. If this ratio is one, then our nuclear production of bottomonium in the nucleus nucleus collision looks exactly the same as a bunch of PP collisions superimposed with one another. However, as we expect, because some states will break up in the plasma, we will expect that, that this number, NAA, is always going to be slightly uh, less than this one. So we'll get suppression of, of production. And so in practice, this is what the experimentalists measure. And then we have to make, as theorists, a prediction for this RAA number. Now, the way that we do this um, these days is using something called an open quantum system approach because bound states are inherently quantum. As we know um, from the hydrogen atom, if you try to model a bound state uh, classically, you run into the problems of radiation and the, the state is not stable and quantum mechanics solved this for us. So in order to, to describe you know, even the most basic uh, physics of, 
of bound states, we need to invoke quantum mechanics. And um, the way that we're going to do that is by um, treating the heavy quarks as a probe that are going, uh, are flying through this, um, this medium, which is composed of the light quarks and, and the gluons. And I, I won't go through the math here, but suffice to say in, in such a what's called open quantum system in which we, we only look at the probe and we integrate out the medium degrees of freedom, um, you have to deal with something called the reduced density matrix. And it obeys um, a kind of uh, a differential equation, which in general are called master equations. And those master equations um, take the form here in, in the conditions generated in a heavy ion collision, at least at high temperatures, you can write them in the, in the following form, where this is just simply a commutator between the probe Hamiltonian and the probe density matrix, but some new things appear which are called collapse or jump operators. And these jump operators encode the internal transitions between different bottomonium states. So as we know, there can be dipole transition between a 1S state which is in the color singlet, to a 1p state, um, which is in color octet. And, and there can be all sorts of transitions that connect all of the different um, bound states um, here. Turns out that there's only six of these jump operators that we need in a quarkulon plasma in order to describe all the possible um, color and angular momentum transitions that can take place in the bound state. And then what we're going to do is do as I described before. We're going to um, shoot a bunch of these states now quantum mechanically through the plasma, and we're going to solve this Lindblad equation for the entire density matrix. And the outcome of this is, is shown here. So here's that observable that I was talking about earlier, RAA. This is as a function of the number of participating nucleons. Over here is a head-on nucleus-nucleus collision, and over here at zero is a peripheral collision. The data um, are for the 1s suppression factor and also the 2s and, uh, and just the 2s. That's all they report here. And, but we make predictions with this um, Lindblad equation solver for the 1s, 2s, and 3s. So here's the 1s, 2s, and 3s predictions. The bands here come from varying something called the heavy quark momentum diffusion constant um, within the range that we, we can measure it on the lattice. So the, the central line is the central value that is extracted from, from lattice simulations and, and top and bottom is, is varying that, that coefficient kappa, the momentum diffusion constant within the, exper in the lattice error bars. The right is, um, is a different transport coefficient, which is called gamma, um, which is related to modifications of the, the real part. And again, this is the central value from the lattice measurements and the top and bottom is the one sigma bands from those extractions. And we can see that um, in both cases, you know, the central line does to seem to describe the, the data quite well. If we integrate over all n part and then compare the, the total RAA um, this is from Alice in, in, in this range, and, and we can continue down to the 2s and also the 3s. In, in all cases within the error bars, we think we have very good uh, theoretical understanding of, of the experimental observations. One place that's particularly um, nice to look at is the, um, is the double ratio. So you, you measure the suppression of the 2s relative to the 1s. You can simply take their ratios from the plot. And there you see that, um, once again, there's um, good agreement with the data, uh, admittedly larger, larger error bars, but um, in, as a function of time, these are going to go down. And we see here that there's very little sensitivity to this momentum diffusion constant, but a larger sensitivity to the modifications to the real part of the potential. And this gives us some hope that by, you know, as, as we reduce the error bars on these measurements, we'll be able to say something about, in particular, this transport coefficient gamma hat here. And it, there's a similar story with the 3s to 1s ratio. Now, as I said, because they've been uh, uh, collecting now bottomonium suppression data for many, many years, it, the statistics is becoming sufficient that they can actually um, extract the V2 for upsilon production. Um, the reason that this is interesting is because there's evidence um, let's look at the lower left-hand plot to begin with, that, um, that 
uh, mesons containing heavy quarks, like the charm quark, which we used to think of as heavy, do flow. And that the, if you look at the magnitude of this V2, it's similar to the light hadrons. However, when, um, when people went and measured the same thing with the upsilon, they found, you know, with now, you know, at this point in time, kind of large error bars, that this was basically consistent with zero, meaning that the bottom onium states don't flow. And, um, and that's due to the fact that they are extremely dilute and heavy pro probes. Um, the, the line here, there's two lines here. One of, one of them is, is a prediction from, from myself and collaborators. What we're able to do now with this latest code, the Lindblad equation solver, is to extract the, um, the V2 of the 1S, and we can do it exactly in the um, experimental centrality bands of interest, and we can also compare the integrated one to the V2 of, of the 1S. And as we can see within error bars here, um, we're consistent with the, lattice, with the experimental data, and the hope is that through increased statistics, eventually this experimental data point will, will have error bars um, on the, the same order as, as our, our experimental, our theoretical prediction. These are measured. Um, it's planned to measure the 2S uh, flow. There's, there's an integrated measurement of the 2S flow with a super large error bar. Um, it's, again, with increased statistics, this will, this will only get better as a function of time. So to conclude, um, what I was trying to explain to you today was, you know, why are we doing all this quark and plasma stuff? Well, one is just to understand <clears throat> the early universe, but we can now reproduce that in the lab, you know, a million times a second by colliding heavy ions together and then confront our theoretical uh, models of uh, the thermodynamics or the time evolution or bottom onium suppression with, uh, you know, state-of-the-art um, experimental data. We, in the first part, I tried to emphasize that we have a pretty decent understanding of the equa equation of state. Um, and that's come from three sources, primarily from lattice QCD, which is a first principles non-perturbative way to get at the equation of state. Second, from this sort of analytic uh, work on, um, on hard thermal loop resummation. And then at low temperatures, um, you know, just using simple hadron resonance gas models. And except for in this transition region between, let's say, roughly 140 and, and 250 MeV, um, we have a, a pretty good understanding of what's going on. Um, but lattice is really going to be the only, the arbiter in that range, and that, that makes their measurements extremely important. I then tried to talk a little bit about elliptic flow. Um, and there is evidence, if you look at the magnitude of these coefficients, V1, V2, V3, which were these flow coefficients, they're very large, particularly V2, and much larger than um, what you would get if the QGP was just a non-interacting firecracker in which the quarks and gluons that were produced just you know, flew out and hadronized and didn't re-interact during, um, during the event. Um, I didn't have time to talk about jet quenching today, um, but... The measurements on this front show that we get significant energy loss. Um, why is having si significant energy loss is important? Because um, you will always get some energy loss, even if it's a hadron gas that, that your jet is flying through. But because a hadron gas is composed of um, color monopoles, right? They're color neutral objects. On average, um, uh, you know, it has much less uh, interaction. Uh, a, a color charged probe has much less interaction with those. Whereas, um, sorry, I said it wrong. They're, they're approximately color dipoles, but a color monopole, which is the quark gluon plasma itself, those have much stronger color interactions and that leads to this significant energy loss. And finally, I tried to show you that we have lots of data now for the suppression and also flow of uh, heavy uh, quarkonium states. And, and this is a yet another smoking gun for having created the quark gluon plasma, because once again, if you were to just model the, the uh, matter as a, as, a, as a gas of hadrons, you would not uh, get agreement with the data. And with that, I'll finish not knowing what time it is. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Good. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. So we have got a few questions uh, in inbox and in common section. So if we allow, we can start our discussion session. Yes, that would be great. The first question, uh, what is the quark gluon plasma and can we made it in our laboratory? Uh, 
Yeah, so um, the quark gluon plasma is this deconfined state where, um, go back to the cartoon picture. The quark gluon plasma is what happens when you deconfine hadrons, but you can recreate it in a lab, but you would have to generate a temperature um, of 10 to the 12 Kelvin, which is a million times hotter than our sun, right? So how would you do that would be hard. Now, the only way we know to do it right now is through collisions of these, um, of these heavy nuclei, lead and gold. And during the, you know, this very um, violent explosion, we generate temperatures on this order. Um, and during this very brief amount of time, we do generate it in the lab, yes. You can generate in a lab, but you need a big particle accelerator. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, we have another question in, in comment section. So I can add the question in our screen. So do gluons and uh, relativistic mass of binding energy suggest a path towards a quantum model of gravity? Um, I think at the level of <clears throat> hadronic physics, um, uh, quantum, quantum gravity has no role to play. OK. Thank you, sir. We have another question. So is it possible to achieve a unified model of QCD and gravitation through generalized Young-Mills theory? Um, well, you can um, put Young-Mills theory in a curved background, right? But the problem is, is always, how do you then deal with the back reaction of uh, the particles on, on the, the background metric? And nobody knows how to do that right now. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know the way to do it, no. Yeah, thank you. This may be the last question. So can we get a quark confinement potential from QCD? Yes, we can get the QCD confining potential, what people call the Cornell potential. Um, from QCD, there's, there's two ways to go about this. One is an analytic way, which is called potential non-relativistic QCD. And by going to higher and higher order in potential non-relativistic QCD, you eventually um, will get um, a Cornell potential out of this systematically. To first order, you get a Coulomb potential, but then as you include the, you know, the next to leading order, next to next to leading order, and now I believe it's at n cubed LO, it starts to look more and more like a, like a, a Cornell potential. Now, um, the other way to do it is the purely uh, numerical way, just by doing a lattice QCD simulation in, you know, in the heavy quark, uh, uh, in the heavy quark mass limit where, um, and then by measuring the free energy between a static quark and an, a static anti-quark, you can then reproduce um, the confining potential um, that I showed you here. Yeah, That's, this is such a measurement. So the answer is yes. You can go from QCD to understanding the confining potential, yes. Yeah, thank you, sir, uh, for your wonderful presentation and discussion session, sir. So it's a great opportunity for our students and viewers to interact with you. And we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology for uh, giving us time. Uh, so as we know that uh, we are staying in a corona pandemic situation still and situation becoming worse uh, recently. So uh, the, we actually uh, want to encourage our student by this program. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we, we have already completed our uh, 256 and today it's our 257 including four Nobel laureate speaker. So, and thanks again for uh, helping us in this regard. Yeah. So it was an honor to give the talk and um, yeah. I'd like to thank you for organizing again, this whole series, you know, doing it a few times is one thing, but you know, doing it 270 something times, that's uh, that's commitment. Thank you, sir. It's an honor, sir. Have a nice day, sir. Okay, thank you.